So yeah, fistula and graft placement. I think this is, it is a challenge. Uh, the thing Charles is gonna talk about with management of steel, I think is really important for later. Um, I would say kind of my, my things from this are when fistula first came out is right around the time that I was in training and it had finished and there was a great educational program that came out with that, which was hugely influential in terms of how uh, dialysis is done in this country. Um, there's great educational things on that. There are dedicated dialysis meetings where people go and that's all they talk about. I think some of those are really phenomenal in terms of increasing your knowledge and awareness and thinking process around dialysis, really important. Um, for me, if I'm a one-trick pony, and dialysis is a ton of what I do, it's ultrasound. Ultrasound, 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 and probably some more ultrasound. And I use ultrasound in the clinic, right? So we've got a vascular lab. The ladies are back here. They do the routine mapping and such. But even so, the ultrasound in my hand, incredibly powerful tool, right? Patient doesn't listen, hit them on the head with it. <laughs> Patient's got no veins, look at their arm with it. Fellows talking up, hit them in the head with it, you know, whatever. But, but ultrasound in your hands before surgery, during your planning of surgery at the time, looking at them after surgery, just incredibly helpful. I'd, I'd much rather go in without my stethoscope or white coat or maybe my pants than without the ultrasound because ultrasound just so incredibly helpful in terms of planning how you're going to do your stuff and then helping you evaluate what the problems are, et cetera. So for graphs, fistulas, all of it. What's our goal? Our goal is to make Mitchell's talk obsolete. We don't need catheters, right? We get people off of catheters, right? Because catheters are bad. But it needs to be easy to access, right? Just because it's got a great thrill and you're proud of it and two liters a minute are going through of it and that kind of stuff doesn't mean it can be used for dialysis. So it's got to be accessible. Hopefully it's durable, right? Because sadly the transplant uh, lists are going up and up and up. And right now the wait time here in Houston is five years. You go sign up for a kidney and you're waiting on the list, it's five years. That's, that's a lot of fistulas and grafts potentially you're gonna have to burn through during that. Requires a little maintenance. Last well, kind of involving thing, right now there's a financial incentive for access centers, et cetera, to be doing routine angioplasties, fistulograms, et cetera, almost daily on people it seems. Uh, but in the future, that's not going to be the case, right? The, the reimbursement for this is going to change to the ACO model that basically DeVita, Fresenius, whoever gets X amount of dollars to take care of dialysis needs. And that's coming because the expense of dialysis is just out of control compared to the, the percentage of patients that it uh, actually is. Um, so least painful, that's really good. Least disfiguring. Well, I can't claim to be a minimally invasive surgeon myself for sure, um, and I think if you need a bigger incision, you need it, but hopefully some of it's not gonna scar them up too badly. Relatively complication-free, that's gonna be important to you and your malpractice uh, amounts that you have to pay each year, and then preserving the next access option. I think, you know, if there's a few things you think about, it's each access is precious, plan for failure, and don't screw your next option because you want to have, be able to do something when this goes down, because it, it almost certainly will fail, right? So simple direct fistulas, right? Radius phallax, brachus phallax, um, proximal radial artery fistulas, transpositions where you have to move the veins around. Really helpful to have all these things in your bag because you're not gonna get to the dokey suggestions just by doing radius phallic fistulas. It's not gonna happen. Not, not if you live in an environment like this where there's sickly people that don't take care of themselves, that have been in the hospital a bunch of times, have had a bunch of IVs, et cetera. So radius phallic fistula, almost always drawn at the wrist. I would tell you, I personally almost never do it at the wrist. Um, again, ultrasound, ultrasound, and more ultrasound. I follow it down, look from the anacube up and down to try and figure out where the veins are. And I follow it down from those pictures that he showed you. It's gonna go into the upper arm's phallic vein and the basilic vein and the perforator vein and follow it down until it's still good. And when it becomes not good or branches too much and becomes small, in my hands that means three millimeters. I wanna see it three millimeters or bigger. Then that's where I'll make my incision, not just open the wrist. When I was in general surgery and did some of these, we just opened the wrist, took a look. If it's there, hook it up. If it's not, open the elbow, take a look. If it's there, hook it up. If not, try and sew on a graft. If that didn't work, go to the upper arm, make an incision, take a look. I mean, that's exactly the way it was done. Really pathetic. If they all look like this every time, this would be like a really short talk. You'd say, okay, just make an incision like this on everybody, hook the veins up and look like this. It's perfect, uh, next lecture. But sadly, that's not the way they usually look, right? Um, then, you know, people are bigger, people are deeper. Um, hard to even see these things, right? And they've got to be able to see it and feel it and stick it uh, for it to be a useful fistula. Brachiocephalic fistulas, this should be the easiest fistula there is, but I would tell you in today's access environment, this is the beast. This is the beast that causes all the problems, and this is probably one of, the, one of my least favorite operations to do, although it should be the easiest. 
because the IVs have always been stuck in, in the Theana cube, right? So it's usually stenotic about two centimeters up above the incision, so you just can't quite reach it there. But hopefully you've seen that with ultrasound, right? Hopefully you've seen that it looks small and thick there, maybe you're gonna plan your incision differently. Uh, so that's a problem. Then where it deep dives into the deep system up at the axilla, that's a real problem. Um, and then causes steel, that's the problem. This is the one that causes most steel in contemporary series. So although it should be the easiest fistula to do, and I think is pretty straightforward because the vessels are bigger, it's one of the most problematic fistulas that there is today. And if it looks all squiggly like this, there's some kind of problem that you're ultimately gonna have to deal with later, either high flow or outflow obstruction, et cetera. This is a fistula that I almost never do. The guy who kind of invented this is now retired, so I think it's probably gonna go away. But but sometimes, if you work anywhere around Oklahoma or anywhere that Tip Jennings ever has talked, you'll see people that have some of these, and it's, oops, it's a fistula uh, from the proximal radial artery so that it doesn't come off the distal where it's small uh, and calcified. It doesn't come off the brachial where you're more likely to have steel, and he does this side-to-side -side connection and lyses the valves here so it kind of pressurizes the whole venous system there and can potentially give you more access options and sites. If your unit's not used to dealing with this, it's a real headache and leads to lots of phone calls because this drawing washes off, right? <laughs> the, the lady that's there on Monday is not there on Wednesday, so they have no idea what to make the person with this fistula in their arm, which is a real challenge. Form transpositions, um, part of my training was under Mike Silva. He actually got a code approved for this, um, and basically it's moving the vein around, and Galveston, I think this is still the way they do even their radiocephalic fistulas, is make a big incision, move the vein, get all the branches away, and then plug it into the artery so you have one single channel. That's not the way most of us would do radiocephalics. For most of us, we would do this for basilic fistulas, right? So Mal showed that big, beautiful vein on the back of the arm. So seeing that, making incisions over it, tying off the gazillion of branches, I now use clips mostly for that. And then tunneling it over the front of the arm because nobody likes to sit there like this during dialysis, getting their arm stuck and holding it like that so the needles don't move. Um, I like making marks on the vein so they don't twist, tunnel it over the front. And again, you get control of the depth of this since you're doing the tunnel, make sure it's nice and superficial because sometimes it will be too deep. And then fuzzy picture and it all works out. Uh, and fortunately, the arm is very tolerant of long incisions and stuff. You don't usually have incisional breakdown in the arm like you do in the groin and, and in the lower extremity and stuff. Uh, basilic transpositions, I think it's important to do transpositions, not just elevations. People don't like getting stuck on the medial part of the arm. It's more sensitive, more painful, you're close to the artery. A deep lunging needle, which does happen, can go down and injure nerves in the artery. So you should really transpose it. Um, and typically we do that in stages where we'll make, a, make an incision out the elbow somewhere, again, as low as we can, connect it, wait a month or so, and then come back and transpose it. It's important to take these branches of the medial and brachycutaneous nerve away um, so that they're not getting stuck. Almost always, at least in my hands, and trying to preserve all these I can, people wind up with numbness in the forearm. Setting expectations, crucial. Doesn't matter what part of vascular surgery you're talking about, there's failures, sometimes lots of them, sometimes a few of them, sometimes really dramatic and tragic. But letting these people know ahead of time you're gonna have some numbness in the forearm, that saves you about 20 minutes later when you're saying, no, I promise you, it's standard. It kind of happens all the time. I know I didn't tell you about it before, but it happens all the time. So, no, I didn't cut your nerve in half, I promise. It's routine, it's not gonna affect your hand. I mean, that, that conversation gets really old in the end, so it's much better to have that in the beginning and say, you're gonna have a little numbness, probably gonna get better. And when they come back, remember, say, remember I told you it's gonna get better, just give it time. If it doesn't, hopefully they're months down the line and have left your practice or something. But, so I divide it completely between first and second stages and retunnel to a superficial, more lateral. And again, the more superficial, the more lateral, and the more length of vein, the better. Because the more that you make it easy on the dialysis unit, the more they're gonna make it easy on you and not torture you. I don't typically do skip incisions, Dr. Wynn does. Um, it's, they look beautiful. Um, I find it to be a real struggle, and then wherever my tunnel is, of course, is where the biggest, deepest perforator is that I can't quite see and have a hard time ligating, et cetera. So I typically just do a big saber slash in the arm and do it. Uh, and you'd like to get it more lateral than this, right? And this sometimes you just run out of vein, uh, but the more lateral you can get it, the better. Um, and again, big arms, it can be a real challenge, and these things can get really big, but it's not typically the fistula that causes steel for whatever reason. Even though it's bigger than this phallic vein, it's not the one that typically causes the problems. Um, so anyway, big, big long lines, they can have incisions, uh, they can have aneurysms, and its failure point tends to be where it goes back down and dives into the deep vein, so make sure you really free that up. Uh, you can do upper arm cephalic transpositions, not my favorite thing to do because sometimes this incision doesn't heal so well, especially in biggish people. Um, 
but again, knowing where the vein is, marking it for them, hopefully then the spots get tattooed um, and can see it. And again, really important to let them know that the vein is not under the incision, otherwise they're just kind of jabbing and stabbing where that is. And I, I make a drawing to send them all back with. This is a person who's had a brachial transposition, not one of my personal favorite operations, more tedious, lots of branches, hard to get enough length, but can be a really good thing for youngish people. This is an immunosuppressed person who'd had all kinds of graft infections and can, can be a good fistula, but not quite as good as the others. And the data would suggest it's not as good as Basilix. And if you put it up against grafts, I'd say it's, it's an equal toss. This is one of the things that I think is one of the more helpful operations to do for people. Uh, especially here in Texas and in Houston where the food is so awesome. It's super visualization. I call it a fistula elevation. It's not. It's a lipectomy. I just don't like to tell people I'm going to cut out your fat. I say I'm going to bring your fistula up. But if the fistula is deeper than it is big, right, the fistula is deeper than it is big, then the proportion is not right, and they're going to be stabbing and jabbing and torturing that person and then torturing you and your office staff if that's the way it goes because it's going to be really hard to hit. So if it's deeper than it is big, then superficialize it. You can do it with big long incisions like I showed at the beginning where you make that and bring it up and retunnel it. Uh, and this came out a few years ago in JVS. Uh, and basically take this fat out so if the skin is sitting right down on it, it makes all the difference in the world. An official that might have been just kind of so-so-ish to use before now becomes right there on the skin, easy to feel, easy to see, easy to stick, and can make hard fistulas into easy fistulas for the dialysis unit, which really hopefully should be your goal. Um, I would say if, if your practice doesn't do this, look up the paper because this is a really helpful thing. Two transverse incisions, make skin plaps just like you're doing mastectomy, then dissect free the fistula so you don't injure it, then scoop out the fat and you can usually get quite a bit of fat out of there, and then close the thing up. I like closing it up over a drain. Uh, Tip Jennings, the same guy has talked about not closing with a drain. I've gotten a couple of seromas when I've tried that, so I personally just like using drains. Usually just stays overnight and then go home the next day. Let that heal for about a month and then usually it gets, it's usable. Uh, arm grafts, I think it's really important, again, that each thing is a precious option. Don't do just one type of graft because then you only have one on each side you can do and preserve your options, right? Really uncommon nowadays to do a graft like this. Um, if people have a vein here, they're probably getting a fistula. So most people that get grafts these days are either elderly folks that you don't think you're going to uh, do a fistula in or can't really benefit from that or people that have had these, these superficial veins exhausted. So when I say don't use up the real estate, don't just make your first graft like this, where it goes right from just above the elbow to right up to the armpit, and then it's a big, beautiful graft that's true, but in two years it's done, right? Now what? Now what are you going to do? Well, you know, you've already got stink grafts running up in the axilla, so if I do an upper arm graft, ultrasound, ultrasound, and ultrasound again, um, so I'll come down to the middle of the arm wherever I think the vein is big, and usually it's brachial vein I'm talking about, and make my incision there. So kind of a graft in the middle of the arm. The same thing in the, in the leg. When you're making a thigh graft, it doesn't have to go to the groin. It can go down the middle of the thigh wherever the arteries and veins are good enough to accommodate it. So saving that so that you can march up the limb later, really helpful because there are a lot of folks that don't get transplants for whatever reason, uh, the late time, etc. So criminal activity in this arm, I would say, somebody's had a forearm graft, there's been lots of activity, obviously, but somebody's had a forearm graft and then has it jumped across up into the basilic vein above the, above the elbow. That's terrible. Now you've taken out the basilic vein uh, fistula as an option for the person, so don't jump it up to there. And then I'd say all of this, this is just vein that was sitting there waiting to be used, and now it's like isolated from the rest of the body, right? Because the, the graft has gone way up high to the armpit. So all this vein that was in here is now kind of wasted territory you can't go back to anymore because this is all obstructed now. So making a graft in here saves you then, this is your next option, then you get four years out of the arm instead of just two years. Um, so again, don't jump across to the basilic and don't go straight to the armpit when you're in the upper arm. Leg transpositions, this can be kind of a make it into a big surgery kind of thing, which makes it fun. Um, but, and it's a little bit gory, obviously, it's a, oops, it's a big vein, right? The femoral vein is what we're talking about. So not superficial femoral vein, but the femoral vein uh, it's a big vein. Saphenous veins typically don't work well for fistula because they don't grow because the wall is too thick. The femoral vein can be a really nice fistula. It's typically already big enough. It just needs to get in somewhere and get sealed and healed. Um, mobilize the full thing down to the knee, transpose it around. I like to hook it up to the mid SFA. You can put it back to the, uh, to the groin. Uh, once they heal up, it works fairly nicely. This is the fistula in here. And this is a young woman with a transhepatic catheter. Yeah, that's a bad deal. Um, saphenous veins, again, don't work so great. 
tend to be thick and tend not to grow. Again, femoral grafts, go to the mid-thigh, save the groin for later. Groin disasters are groin disasters, whether it's from a fem pop or an AV graft. You don't want to turn your access more complicated than it needs to be, so stay out of the groin if you can. And then it's kind of down the thigh. It's easier for them to see and feel. Uh, you don't have to make it so long to get away from the groin to have it accessible. Uh, they don't have to pull their shorts uh, up so high or whatnot. Um, and again, that makes it nice. Staying away from the groin is always good if you can. So start simple, work your way up, preserve your future options, absolutely key. So simple direct fistula is first, transpositions versus grafts later, um, and then femoral access is way down the line. Unless you have a young person who doesn't have good upper extremity stuff and you do a leg fistula, you don't typically do the other. So who bits of us from fistulas? Almost everybody, right? Um, grafts, who should get a graft? It's not clear, but probably the elderly patients are going to be better off with grafts than fistulas. Uh, the data is certainly swinging that way. Fistulas that don't work are not as good as grafts, right? Grafts are better than fistulas that don't work. So plan for fistulas that you think have a really good chance of working. If you're in sort of the, the DAC criteria where only 40% of your fistulas are maturing, that's not good enough and you need to do better. Um, think about the hero graft for patients with exhausted options. Right, for patients with central venous obstruction, the hero graft can be really helpful. Um, essentially just a graft that you can put in, connect it through. Uh, you'll probably do some of these in your training. Really helpful to have this in your armamentarium for patients with uh, central venous occlusions. The hybrid graft, good for people who have kind of wiped out their arm options that you can basically stink graft up into a patent area that you couldn't have gotten to surgically. This is way beyond the axilla where the decent vein is. Um, patients have already had stink grafts, so good to have some extra tools on your hand. Okay. That's everything you possibly know.